Welcome to Gold Derby. I'm senior editor Denton Davidson here with the artist formerly known as Gumball on The Masked Singer, Scott Porter. Scott, congratulations on making it all the way to the finale. You came close to winning um, and all you got was that T-shirt. Is that what the deal is? <laughs> well, what's, tell me the story here. Uh, you know, every everybody that performs on The Masked Singer gets a bit of a pit crew, a, a team that helps them, you know, get to and from stage, helps... Uh, with vocal coaching and helps with costuming and G team gumball had uh, just an amazing amazing time uh erica and nate and p and allison anthony jess they took care of me while i was there and at the end they gave me this and everybody on team gumball got this shirt so um it, it's special to me and i figured what better time to break it out today you know i love that well, yeah. you improved I think there, I mean, I think you'd get the most improved award um, so much throughout the season, I, just better and better. Were you rehearsing just like your butt off or were you working on vocal lessons or was it just growth and confidence as you moved through each round that you sort of just started thinking, believing more in yourself? You know, I, I felt good about the first night, you know, I was singing Kelly Clarkson, you know, I'm singing her song. Yeah. And, and close to her key. And it was Wizard of Oz night. And I didn't necessarily pick that song. I got heart as my theme. And they kept on going through different songs saying, hey, which one fits? Which one fits? And during dress rehearsal that night, I thought I had it all together. And I had a, like a panic attack, had to get off the stage, had to get out of that head, had to had to get fresh air. And then I ended up in the bottom two, and it had me really questioning myself. But I got to say, uh, my vocal coach on the show, Allison, um, she wasn't just a coach. She was like a therapist as well. Yeah. And my wife, the two of them really tried to get my confidence back up and going. Because at that point, I was like, did I, did I make a mistake here? But um, no, I just, I think once I had a little more confidence the athlete in me took over. I played high school and college football and we had a saying, leave it all on the field. And I realized I can't be careful on that stage. I can't try to hold anything back. I have to actually just go for this. You know, um, I think a lot of what I do now on camera is, oh, hold that back, be nuanced, do all these things. But on that stage, you're performing with that live audience. It's leave it all on the stage. And once I started to do that, I started to gain confidence and I relished being in SmackDowns. It meant yeah. I got to sing more. So bring it on. I don't know if anyone in the history of the mess, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know for sure. I'd have to go back and look, but I don't know if anyone has been in a SmackDown, their first episode, and then gone all the way to the finale like that. Um, so you were, I mean, you were fighting for your life. Um, and then by the end, you were, you were dancing, you were beatboxing. I mean... <laughs> Showing off different skills in that finale. Yeah, I think I'm at my best when my back's against the wall. I think, you know, when I'm on set, like on Ginny and Georgia, and we the sun's going down and all we have is five minutes to get a shot for a scene and we only have one take and we got to get it done, I deliver. Yeah. <laughs> so I think like in this case, you know, that's kind of what it was every single day, just trying to deliver. And it wasn't about winning this show. It was about, I love this so much getting up there and singing. I loved Gumball. I loved everything about this experience and I didn't want it to end. So it was less about winning and more about not going home. You know, I just wanted to get to the end. And I did this season, I sang more than any other mask. And I'm really proud of that actually. So like I said, put me in the bottom two, put my back up against the wall. I'm gonna give you all I got. Uh, I know that I can do that and, and it worked. Did you have a favorite performance or one that meant the most? It's really tough. You know, I think, of course, Wide Open Spaces meant a lot to me because of who it was dedicated to and the motivation behind doing that song. It was girl group night and I've never sung a chick song, but you know, they once again were like, we really like the idea of you singing this number. I was like, okay. But then Carry On My Wayward Son was a song that I knew I wanted to do on this show from the start, you know? And that was kind of for my parents in a way. You know, they supported me through all of this journey and becoming a full-time entertainer is not always easy. 
you know, and I'm not saying, you know, woe is me. I I'm in a, I'm in a field where, you know, work is pretty easy comparatively to so many other fields, but the journey to get there was, was tough. And so that was for them, but then I lived it was for my kids, you know? So between those three, they all had a different part of my heart in them. And so that's, I don't think I can choose just one, but um, yeah, those, those three were special. Did you know Vanessa Hudgens was um, goldfish or <laughs> I spoke to right her. Away. She said she never knew anyone. She's like, I was terrible. She's like, I tried. I didn't know who anyone was. How good, how many people were you able to figure out? I knew Clay Aiken as soon as he opened his mouth. Yeah. I knew Corey Feldman as soon as he opened his mouth. He hosts a live rock band karaoke in LA sometimes called Karaoke that I've attended. And I think I've heard him actually sing his first song in that setting. <laughs> I figured out Jennifer Lewis before the end of my group. And I knew Vanessa as soon as she opened her mouth. Uh, Chrissy Metz had me. Chrissy Metz definitely had me. And I was... Going back and forth uh, on Thelma, I, there was a couple of guesses that I had, a lot of them very similar to the judges. But um, but yeah, Vanessa has an unmistakable quality to her voice, and I have a tendency to be able to pick up on some of that stuff. And I think it's why I can do different genres of music. I think I can do a Jason Mraz because I hear his voice like very clearly in my head, and I I can do, you know tether from one republic because i hear his voice in my head and i think a bit of that gets into my performance so i i'm uniquely suited i think i think i could be a guest judge at some point we'll i was gonna see. say it sounds like you would be a good <laughs> guest panelist to to step in if someone needs a, a day off um i want to fan out a little bit about one of the greatest shows ever on tv friday night lights um, talk about that experience. Cause for me, I got into that show late. I like, I think it was a couple seasons in and then I just was like binging obsessed. I think it's one of the greatest family sports dramas ever on TV. And I, and I mean that seriously. <clears throat> what, what do you remember about that series and that incredible cast? Like, look at what's happened to the, to the cast of that show. Yeah, I think it was, I, okay, let me try to be very clear with how I'm going to say this. Um, it had a clear vision from the very beginning at the top, all the way to the bottom. Peter Berg knew exactly what he wanted the show to be. Jason Kadams knew exactly how he wanted to deliver the story. And the actors were all cast so perfectly. It just felt easy in a way. Jason street is one of the most challenging characters I've ever played in my life, but it felt easier because we all had each other's backs. We had clear vision of what we were doing. Uh, dare I say clear eyes. Uh, and, yeah. and we were able to deliver that at all times. There was a trust amongst everyone. Pete called NBC and said, look, I don't want this show to be cast contingent, which is a phrase that gets tossed around when you get a show on a network where the network gets to put a couple of their choices into the mix. And Peter Berg said, no, I, I I want this show to be as authentic as possible. So I need free reign to cast anyone. And he cast a bunch of no ones at the time. And yeah, we've all become something. And, yeah. and Friday Night Lights did that for so many of us. But the talent of the people that were cast was apparent from day one as well. So it was just every single level was a hit. And from casting to writing to directing, I, I don't know that many shows have that fortune of talent and uh it was just very lucky to be a part of it did your football experience help in any way it, um or hinder like what what talk about that a little bit yeah it did it it definitely did i saw the film in theaters like five six times with different teammates my high school football team made it to the state quarter and state semifinals in florida my junior and senior year and we were a little school that had almost zero in the way of success at that level until our class came along. So we were forged in fire and felt like underdogs. And we just felt very much like the Permian Panthers. And I remember losing our final game by less than a touchdown and collapsing to the ground and having the moment like Lucas Black has in the film, just like we were so close. And the immediate realization is it's all over. 
yeah. this was our shot and we don't do this again tomorrow, you know? And that played into how Jason Street, you know, when everything's taken away from him, I knew what that meant to him. So anyway, that was uh, that was how it helped, you know, just to to give Street the the depth and, and the understanding of everything that it was taken from him. Um, but it also helped like in the locker room scenes, we did like improv and yeah. I knew all the terminology and everything. So that helped as well. But, you know, it's that same kind of fight that I was able to use in Mass Singer. You know, I, I've used to perform for a living and then I got into Hollywood and it became more of a television and film thing. And they have a tendency in Hollywood to try and stick you in a box. You know, this is what you did last. So this is what you are now. And I, when I got on stage again, I realized, oh, this is what I've been missing and I don't want it to end. So I think that was part of the fight. So. Stuck and that's one of your great successes. I want to talk about some failures because um, I think it's inspiring for people to know about this stuff. You talked in your clue package about being that kid in Florida who just was constantly rejected by Disney over and over again. Yeah. Um, so what what made you what what made you want to get into the business so bad at such a young age? And what was that break for you? What was the who said yes first? My parents. Uh, met in a rock band. My mom was a single mother until I was about six. Met my father. He was a drummer. And then she became the lead singer of his rock band. And I grew up setting up my dad's drums and, you know, watching them perform on weekends and hanging out with my family at bars and like falling asleep in the office manager's couch. And um, I had a love of music. But when I went to college, I was a football player and a structural engineering major. And I had to pay for that. And I was juggling jobs like Publix and Panera and all of these different things. And then I started singing on the side and I'd make more money than I would make, you know, in 20 hours a week at AT AT&T or whatever I was doing. So I started going, okay, this can get me through school. And that's really why I was performing was try and pay for school. And I left school with no debt. I also left school with no degree, but... (laughs) But I got my first gig after two years of auditioning at these cattle calls and not booking anything uh, as a beatboxer in a children's sing-along show called The Happy Campers at Animal Kingdom. And that was my first break. And after that, it kind of just snowballed. By the time I left Orlando, I knew 17 different shows. Some of them were singing and dancing. Some of them were stunt and acting. Some of them were beatboxing. I spent a year in Tokyo, six months in Mexico City, a year in Las Vegas, two years in New York doing beatboxing and singing on stages. But at the end of the day, I think I said before my final package, you know, this industry, it never stops. The rejection never stops. Yeah. You know, unless you are tier zero, mega class, bankable box office star and get offers all the time, you are putting yourself out there constantly. I've probably auditioned for 400 pilots in my life. I've booked seven. Like, yeah. look at the stats on that. But I'm successful. And it's just a part of what we do and how we live in this business. So, uh, oh, and interesting and interestingly enough, and I and I tried to get it into the finale, but there was already a ballad in the finale. Go the Distance was the song that I booked my first gig with. That was the first song that booked me uh, a part. And that was also a very meaningful song for me to sing. So um, it was in the recap episode, but I I wish I would have been able to do it in the finale. But, you know, they got to make a show. It's got to have variety, right? (laughs) Um, And real quick, before we before we let you go, what's what's next? Where are the fans going to see you? What are you working on? What's coming out? I'm currently shooting the third season of Ginny and Georgia. We got picked up for seasons three and four. So there's a lot more in store for fans of Ginny and Georgia. I'm currently working on two games, uh, video games uh, that I can't talk about yet, but they're both going to be huge. And uh, I'm voicing a very familiar role uh, to people who love the comic book universe, I suppose. Um, And uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's all I'm focused on right now. And then getting back home and just spending the fall, maybe coaching my kids' sports teams again. Yeah. You know, this was such a cool journey. I, I'm sorry to say goodbye to Gumball. Um, I didn't get to create the costume, but I did get, uh, and it's May right now, which is Huntington Disease Awareness Month. You see this blue band here. 
If you go back and look closely at Gumball, everything's symmetrical except for his two hands. One of them has a blue band painted on it. Gordon Tarpley, the designer of the costume, asked me if I wanted it on there, and I did. So I had this band. Um, you know, my wife is is battling HD, my mother-in-law, and and uh, you know, I talked about it in the show, and this was part of that. This is part of my costume. So. You know, for the rest of this month, I'll be trying to raise awareness for uh, HDSA, which is the Huntington's Disease Society of America. So I've got work, I've got charity, and uh, I've got the come down of doing this incredible show ahead of me. <laughs> and I would endorse um, Scott Porter as guest panelist um, in, in future seasons. So such a fun season. Congratulations again on making it all the way to the final two. Scott, thanks for sitting down with Cold Derby today. Hey, thank you so much. And thanks for all the coverage and all the kind words throughout the season too. Trust me, we're all watching <laughs> because we can't talk to anybody about it. So reading about it is basically the only communication we have with anyone about this journey. So thank you all so much. All right.